Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? This is a program where we are focusing all together on the Bible because there's nothing, no more important book than the Bible. It is the message of God to the human race, and the human race is you and me, as well as everybody else, of course, who lives in the whole world. And uh, God has um, some very, very important things to tell us uh, that we should know about. In fact, they're so important that God has given us the command to bring this gospel to the whole world so that people all over the world can hear what God wants to say to them. And it all is found in the Bible. That's why God has also seen to it that through the years the Bible has been translated into a great many other languages so that in their own language they can read this message from God to themselves and uh, to their country or to their people and uh, that's why in turn we continue to send out the gospel and at the same time God gives us a grand opportunity to explain many things about the Bible you know God has in his uh, divine economy has uh, set up teachers and of course the teachers better be faithful to the word of God in fact God warns let not many of you be teachers because you will be judged more severely that is if you are bringing your own kind of a gospel if you are simply uh, uh, picking and choosing what you like out of the Bible and teaching that and not bringing the whole counsel of God and my my that is this a prevalent situation in an enormous number of teachers today you're in deep trouble with God because you are saying God has said this when God has not said it if anyone teaches the Word of God they better do their homework and check and check and double check and triple check to make sure that what they're teaching is faithful to the Word of God and uh, and uh, but nevertheless this is the way God's divine economy is set up and so by God's mercy he's raised up a ministry like family radio where we can reach into the whole world a great percentage of the whole world uh, with the gospel so that people not only hear the word of God the very word right from the mouth of God but also they can hear uh, explanations that, that are fair, firmly based on the truth of the Bible to assist them in understanding more and more about this word. And that's what kind of a thing we talk about on the Open Forum program. We are simply on this program eager to uh, learn more and more. What does God tell us in his word? Well, this is your program. We want to hear from you. So, shall we take our first call tonight, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening. Yes. Brother Camping, how are you doing tonight? Very well, thank you. Listen, Brother Camping, I've tried for so long to get through, and last night I heard a uh, sister um, uh, uh, breathe the words, thank you very much, thank you very much, and I want to say the same thing. Thank you so much for bringing the truth to all of us. It, uh, I started listening years ago, and I, I, I just did not have my eyes open at that point to the truth that you were bringing, and I kept listening, and I kept listening, and I kept reading, and uh, uh, little by little, little by little, and pretty soon, yes, yes, I, by God's grace, I started to understand and now <clears throat> I take the broadcast, so when I'm in a, another area where I can't hear family radio, I pop in a tape, and it's all new again. <laughs> but, um, you know, the one thing that I wanted to bring out was the fact that everything that you have talked about, the reality of what's going on in the churches, is 
each day it just um, astonishes me at the uh, gospel list uh, message that they offer. And I just wanted to, um, you know, see if we can maybe talk about that a second just to... Well, uh, well you know, it, two things happen. First of all, those of us whose eyes have been spiritually open become more and more sensitive to truth. In other words, we are learning more and more what real truth is. And, and uh, therefore, even if there were no movement at all, spiritually speaking, in the congregations, we would have a sense that they are falling away simply because we have a better knowledge of where real truth is. But then when that's accompanied by the fact that they uh, are falling away, and they are falling away, and the Bible tells us why, of course, that the Holy Spirit has absented himself from the local congregations. So they're trying their best to uh, have a membership and uh, to, to flourish, and, uh, and yet they're doing it without any help from God, if we can imagine that. Uh, I'm sure that they hold their prayer meetings and they and they're beseeching the Lord, oh Lord, give us wisdom now. And yet, because the Holy Spirit is not there, there is no wisdom that comes from God. It's all man's wisdom, and therefore uh, we uh, who are on the outside and who uh, can look more objectively at the whole situation next thing uh, see something very astonishing as this congregation or that congregation uh, goes into that this kind of a, a program of trying to reach people or uh, this, this preacher begins to talk about what he's talking about and we say wow wow don't they realize how far away they are from the truth and and so the both both things are happening simultaneously and and it is a time of great sorrow for us, of course, because we know that those who are remaining there are in deep trouble, deep trouble. And it won't get better, it's going to get worse, because God indicates that they are being bound uh, for as tares uh, for the fire. That is, they are being prepared for Judgment Day, and God explains this by saying, for example, that he gives them a strong delusion that they will believe a lie. What terrible, terrible language. What an indictment. And yet we see it, and we see these dear people that are just blindly going along, thinking all is well, when it's not well at all. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, how are you doing, Brother Camping? Very well, thank I, you. I have a question. Before I became a believer, I was divorced and I remarried, and um, now I know that was wrong now, but as far as intimacy, should I stop that, or how should we conduct that relationship? Well, no. I, if you have married a second time, of, co of course it was a wrong marriage, but it's still a marriage, and from everything I can read in the Bible, you are now to continue in that marriage as if it were a first marriage, but just never, never think about divorce again. Never. That word ought to be outside of your vocabulary. Thank you very much, Brother Cam. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, instead of taking pot shots from the safety of your sniper's nest in the studio there, why don't you have a church, a church leader or a theologian on the program, and then you can show him from the Bible where you're right and the rest of the world is wrong. Well, the problem with that is, is that a theologian, and, and I can understand your, your uh, suggestion, and one would think it's a pretty good suggestion. The problem is, however, that there is this matter of hermeneutic, that is the method of Bible interpretation. And the typical, and I, uh, this is pretty general, of, true of every single congregation, every church leader, the hermeneutic that has that they follow in understanding the Bible 
is a man-made hermeneutic that uh, that can, cannot be justified from the Bible. But they have have uh, promised to follow that when they graduated from seminary and when they were ordained as a pastor. Uh, they made a promise that they would follow the rules of their denomination, and that includes this hermeneutic. And because of that hermeneutic, it's impossible for us to look at the same verse and come up with the same conclusion. That's an impossibility, if it, if that is particularly if that verse is, uh, is uh, in any sense a metaphor or a parable, and, and an enormous amount of Scripture is written that way. That's why, for example, I use the illustration again and again, because it's an easy illustration of uh, Mark 16, verse 17 and 18. These signs will follow those that believe. If they pick up sticks, uh, 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 or excuse me, they, uh, they will uh, pick up serpents. Uh, they, if they drink any deadly thing, it will not harm them. And if they lay hands on the sick, they'll get well again and they'll speak with new tongues and so on. And invariably, they absolutely cannot understand that. So what happens then is if we were trying to talk together, we would be uh, talking different languages. In other words, uh, the, the individual you're speaking of would be speaking based on his hermeneutic. And on the other hand, the biblical hermeneutic is that Christ spoke in parables. And without a parable, he did not speak. And he would not understand that. So it would be very futile, very, very futile. And so it's just a matter of, of we're just going to have to patiently teach what the Bible says and uh, and uh, I'm sorry, but we just can't follow through with an idea like that. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, uh, Harold. This is uh, Heretic Connor. Um, when the Lord returns, what is going to happen to believers? Um, Will they just remain where they are when the Lord returns, or are they going to be gathered into one place, or exactly what's going to happen? The Bible is very clear. There will be two in the field. One is taken, and the other is left. In other words, or we read in, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, we'll not all sleep, but we'll all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And with that change means that we're going to be raptured to be with Christ in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 17 particularly teaches that we will be caught up to be with Christ. Okay, then what happens to the unbelievers? They, they remain here to stand for judgment. Uh, every unbeliever that has ever lived on the face of the earth will have been resurrected. And they, together with those who are presently living, at the, and that could mean that there's maybe as many as, uh, we can speculate, 12, 15 billion people waiting to stand for their moment to, to be stand for trial. Uh, and they, each one individually will stand for trial. Now, how God arranges all, all that, we have no idea, of course, but we know that God's an infinite God. And, uh, and we know that this will be done on an individual basis. The Bible at least teaches that clearly. And they will be found guilty because uh, there's not one sin of theirs that have been paid for. And uh, they will receive the sentence. And we know absolutely what the penalty will be, what the sentence will be, eternal damnation. Uh, no no uh, question at all. And uh, and uh, that's what's going to happen. Uh, okay. They'll be cast away to a place called hell. Okay. Now I I agree w with you on on the point that believers will be uh, taken up, but the manner I don't think I I agree with you totally because in Matthew twenty four thirty one it says that the angels uh, gather the elect from the four uh, ends. Of the sky, four winds, four ends of the sky to the other, and in First Thessalonians 4:16, it just says that we're caught up, 
and it appears to me that those are two separate uh, raptures, one by angels and one by the Lord uh, himself uh, to where we just uh, shoot up into the air to meet the Lord. Now, you don't think those are two separate raptures? Oh, absolutely not. There's only one rapture. The Bible says in again and again in uh, John 6 that the believers will be uh, raised up on the last day. Four times God says that. And the last day is uh, is uh, simultaneous with what we're reading about in First Thessalonians 4, where it says the uh, graves will open, and or that is the believers will be resurrected, and we at the same time will be caught up in the air to be with Christ. This, there's not two raptures, and it's the, it's only one destination. And you know, God is not a respecter of person. Every tr- person's every true believer will be treated like every other true believer. There's no there's no difference of any kind. But there's a lot of mystery. We uh, we can uh, paint the broad sweep. Uh, we don't know every specific detail, uh, but uh, we do know this: that the, the believers will be instantly given a brand new resurrected soul and caught up to be with Christ. That we can know for certain. We know that the unbelievers will stand for judgment. The books will be open. That is the record of their life and all of their sins are well known to Christ. There's nothing that is hidden, and they will be judged on the basis of what's in those books, and any, even the slightest sin will be sufficient. Even one slight sin uh, would be sufficient to have them removed into hell, and of course, anyone standing there will have much more guilt than that. But these things we know, but now insofar as how all of this this happens, and if we're right on the edge of eternity. It's probably already in eternity when this is happening, and we don't even know what eternity is. So we have to say uh, there's some things we don't know about that. But we do know that when all of this is happening, uh, there is no more mercy, no more grace, no more salvation. It is too late. It's that time that we read about in Matthew 7, verse 21 that there will be many in that day who will say, did we not do this wonderful thing and that wonderful thing in your name? And Christ will say, I never knew you. Depart from me that work iniquity. What a terrible, terrible, terrible moment that will be. An awful, awful, awful moment when that happens, and it will happen. It is absolutely coming. But thank you. Good point. Uh, Harold, you also brought up the point that two in the field, one taken, and one left behind. And I think you were uh, bringing out that the one taken is is the rapture of believers to the Lord. But in Luke 17, verse 37, that exact same statement of two in the field, two in the bed, uh, two grinding at the stone, are taken, and then the... Uh, Disciples asked the Lord, where are they taken to? And the Lord answered and said to him, said to them, where the body is, there also will the vultures be gathered. Excuse now, me. I always Excuse thought me. that those days... Excuse me. Now, you said something that was not in the Bible. In other words, you made an addition. You said, where, Lord, are they taken? The Bible doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. It says in verse 36, two shall be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And now he he, he didn't say, Where, Lord, is the one taken, or Where, Lord, is the one left? It's just, Where, Lord? And then the next statement, he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together, the vultures will be gathered together. And uh, and we have to read this in the light of everything else the Bible teaches, and we know that it is the believers who are taken. Uh, we tie that into First Thessalonians 4. You see, when we we got to be really careful when we read these sentences that we don't accidentally put something in there that our mind thinks uh, should be, and it really isn't there. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. 
Yeah, I have a question about people with infirmities like seizures or... Uh, you have a question about which? Like, Apostle Paul had a thorn in the flesh. Yes. Is that exactly. like saying that he was blind or deaf or... You know, the the remember what that thorn in the flesh was? It was a messenger of Satan. Yeah. All right. Now, does Satan make somebody blind? Does he? Do they make them uh, crippled? And the Bible says no. God says in Exodus four, "I am the one who makes man." Uh, uh, how does God say it to uh, to Moses in Exodus chapter four? Let me turn to that a second. Uh, God uh, said to Moses. Uh, 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 who made man's mouth? I'm reading Exodus 4, verse 11. Who made man's mouth? Who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? So just because someone had a, uh, an affliction, and there is language in the Bible that seems to indicate that the Apostle Paul had a uh, visual affliction of some kind, but but that was not from Satan. That was from God, according to Exodus chapter 4. So we got to look in another direction. I was just wondering what God thinks about them kind of people who have seizures. and. Well, but, but you see, we're living in a world where which is under the curse of God. It was subjected to futility. And so we find uh, poisonous uh, bacteria and viruses and... Uh, all manner of things that God has put on this world. Not Satan. God has put it on this world. When there's a devastating volcano and thousands are killed, that is what God has done, not Satan. Uh, uh, God is in charge of all this. And, uh, and yet, uh, uh, that one who has seizures, that one who is blind, that one who is, uh, who is dying of an, of an illness that he... Uh, for which there is no healing, can still live to the glory of God. And there are many who, uh, in their particular uh, illness or affliction, truly live to the glory of God. Now, even in Paul's case, let's go back to him. He had a serious problem, a thorn in the flesh, and based on the biblical language, we know full well that it was the Judaizers who were under the power of Satan who were making life exceedingly miserable for him. We base that on what we read in Numbers chapter 33, where God told ancient Israel that because uh, they had not destroyed the Canaanites, the unsaved all around them, they would be pricks in their sides and thorns uh, thorns in their flesh and prick, pricks in their sides. And, and, uh, and uh, that is, it would be like a thorn in the flesh. And now, even in Paul's case, here it is Satan now who's harassing him through these Judaizers. And what did Jesus say? Oh, come to me. I'll remove it for you. No way. He said, my grace is sufficient. In other words, the salvation I have given to you is completely sufficient for you to endure this because my strength is is uh, uh, how did he put it? Uh, uh, um, uh, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. That is, as you become more and more dependent upon me, uh, the greater your spiritual strength will be. And so, uh, and not only that, but you know, when we are a true believer, we can expect suffering. Uh, especially at the hand of others because we complete the sufferings of the Lord Jesus as we read in the book of Colossians. Christ suffered as he brought the gospel. We now are his body bringing the gospel. And so even as he suffered, he was vilified, he was reviled. And so we're going to be vilified and reviled and, and even may lose our life. But whatever happens... We, uh, we, it's going to cause us individually to trust God more and more. Spiritually, it will help us to grow. And, uh, and, and yet, uh, insofar as God's economy is concerned, it is the very thing we can expect as true believers. Now, I was 
I have two questions. Is one, I was born with seizures at the age of 10 months and still have them. Now I feel like it's that God that plagued me. All right. So God, had, uh, it was God's provision that you live with seizures. Does that mean that you're a less, you, you're going to be a less child of God in some way? Absolutely not. You have just as much uh, a possibility of being a child of God as anybody else. God is not a respecter of persons. Right. Then two is I was told that I was. I was blessed by the grace of God for preferring to Paul with his thorn in the flesh. Well, his, your seizures are not a thorn in the flesh. The thorn in the flesh is defined. Let me read to you from Numbers chapter 33. Let's let the Bible speak to this. There we read in Numbers chapter 33, verse... Uh, uh, verse uh, 55, verse 55, and this comes from the mouth of God. If ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. Now, <clears throat> when, we are, when, when we are reviled, when we are uh, harassed, when we are vilified by our friends and our acquaintances, that we can call a thorn in the flesh, but not physical illness or, or spiritual Ill, or illness or mental illness. That is not the thorn in the flesh. That is simply uh, the, the evidence that we live in a world that is cursed by sin. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, Brother Camping. Um, what does it mean in the Bible when it says, um, no man has seen God's face at any time? I'll, well, I'll speak to that in just a moment. Just hold on, would you please, for this message. We have a caller on the line who's asked the question, how do we understand this, that no man has ever seen God's face? And doesn't that give us a massive contradiction? Because don't, doesn't the Bible teach that the Lord Jesus was God and never ceased to be God and didn't countless people, thousands of people, see him face to face? How can that be? Well, when we again follow the biblical principle of comparing Scripture with Scripture, we find what God means by that is by no man has ever seen God in the full effulgence of his glory as he really is. We would be consumed in an instance if we did. The closest thing that we can read about in the Bible to that was remember Moses was taken, went up to, on Mount Sinai, uh, and uh, and God uh, uh, hid him in a cave or in a cleft in the rock, a hole in the rock, and then God passed by in His full glory, and and all Moses saw was the back parts, just the edge of His glory. He didn't see Christ face to face or God face to face. He didn't see God in all of his glory. He just saw the back parts. And, and uh, then the Bible describes the impact it made upon Moses. Moses uh, 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 hiked down the, the mountain uh, later on, and, uh, and the, uh, his fellow Israelites could not even look at him. His face was shining. Uh, with the reflected glory of God, and he had to cover it with a veil. Otherwise, he couldn't come in amongst his fellow Israelites. And so what God simply means by that is no one has seen God in all of his glory. Now, it's going to be very interesting. When Christ appears, literally, physically appears uh, at the end of time, and every eye shall see him. 
and he's coming on the clouds of glory. Uh, first of all, uh, whatever glory he manifests, and, and will he show his full glory? I doubt it. He won't have to do that, of course, but he may. But if he did, it would mean God would have to qualify the billions of people who would see him, otherwise they would be destroyed just looking at him. And, uh, and God, of course, can do that because God is God. But how he's going to do that? That's God's business. We don't have to speculate about that at all. The same thing as when the Bible talks about the Godhead. You know, when it says um, the full, all fullness of the Godhead bodily, it pleased God to give that to Christ. Yes. So, so the fullness of the Godhead it has not been seen. No. Basically. No, no. We know about it. We read about it. Uh, but what do we really understand about God? We're talking about His eternal majesty who is from eternity past, who has no beginning. We can't even conceive of that. We can't even uh, begin to think of what that, uh, what, how that could be. Number two, when He uh, began uh, this time on earth here, or first of all, He created the universe, He spoke and brought this fantastic complex universe that reaches out billions of light years into space on the one hand and on the other hand is uh, in all the detail of the of the uh, creatures that he's created and 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 so on uh, how could that how can how can any one have spoken that into existence we we don't know we have no idea uh, but god is so great and so magnificent and the and the amazing thing is that when we become a child of god we can speak of him as our father and we can come to him boldly with our petitions and our thanksgiving and we can have this intimate relationship with him. Oh, my, I don't understand that at all. How can that be that I, who am nothing uh, and by nature a sinner, that I, I, uh, I can have that kind of a relationship with Almighty God, as every true believer can have? Brother Camping, Brother Camping are we going to see you in Santa Cruz? Lord willing, you will. If I'm if, if I'm still healthy and well, I, you, you will see me there. At least that's my plan. Thank you. Thank you for calling. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Well, welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello. Um, I have a question to ask about your your how you um, interpreted the the Bible as far as uh, uh, divorce. Did you did you say that that there was a time when you believed that divorce was okay? When I was in still a part of the church age early on, and when I was a young man, I served as a an deacon and then as an elder, and uh, and uh, uh, at first. Uh, uh, I remember that w we were always taught there is not to be divorce for any reason. And then when I was about 35 years of age, the, and I remember this very vividly, uh, uh, the church began to, and a lot of other denominations about the same time, began to investigate this possibility of divorce for fornication. And so finally, uh, and at that time, I trusted the church theologians a whole lot. I really believed that they were men of God, that they really knew what they were talking about. And, and so I went along with what the church taught, that, that uh, it, it must be that, that it is possible there could be divorce for fornication, although I admit at the time, as I, I was serving as an elder, and and we would have uh, people who would be struggling with their spouse. Uh, the wife has got a, uh, a husband is a real problem, or the husband or wife has a problem. And and I remember that I was always a little bit troubled when, whenever a, a suggestion was made about divorce and. And, I, and so even when I was, uh, right after that, I began to do the open forum, 
And when people asked me about this, I said, well, you know, you have to forgive, you have to forgive, you have to forgive. And, and yet it appears that if finally nothing else works, uh, you do have that last resort of divorce for fornication. Well, then it turned out that every time I got into that question, uh, there, were, there was someone who called. I have no idea who it was. I have the slightest idea. Someone spoke very quietly, and they said, Brother Camping, now you just, you just mentioned on the air that, uh, that uh, you, you can divorce for fornication. Have you read clearly 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39, for example, which says that uh, a wife is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives? And I still remember very vividly, because I was struggling with this, I, I thought, yeah, I, I, and I would kind of shove off the, an answer, uh, the, the question, and, and, uh, and this went on for just a little bit of time, and this happened several times, that, that the same voice, hey, have you read, and he'd give me another verse, and finally I couldn't stand it any longer. I, I knew that something was wrong, and, and so I began to personally uh, uh, study this question very personally. I didn't go to my church uh, uh, fathers or church theologians at all because uh, I, I knew where they were going, but I wondered just what does the Bible say? And then I learned that, no, you cannot divorce for any reason whatsoever. And so I began to teach that and have taught that ever since. Well, I, I, I think that um, verse that you quoted probably helped me out a little bit more to understand your standpoint on it, and uh, and just one other question: Did you did you change your mind in like a day or a week, or was it a gradual process? Oh, it was a gradual. I struggled with it. I struggled okay. with it. I I I I prayed for wisdom, and uh, over a period of uh, two or three months, I began to see. I I my church has has was going down the wrong path, and I had. I uh, had been going along with it because I trusted the church uh, leaders and the, the church theologians. And uh, I, in fact, in fact, it was one of the things that, that caused me to raise questions. Don't ever, ever trust your church theologians. Okay. Uh, be sure you're trusting only the Bible. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Hi. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, yes. Would you please tell me some scripture on speaking in tongues and why it is not biblical? And I'll take my answer off the air. Thank you. Yes. Uh, you see, the phenomenon of tongues was a true biblical phenomenon that did take place for a few years in the church at Corinth. We can read about that, for example, in 1 Corinthians 14 that there were a few in that congregation who were, received the gift of tongues and frequently was in the form of a prayer. Uh, it was a message from God in a, some kind of a heavenly language, and God also gave that a gift to others in that congregation to interpret what uh, that uh, heavenly language, uh, uh, what that message was that this individual spoke when he spoke in a tongue. And uh, that was a legitimate, biblical, uh, God-glorifying phenomenon that did take place amongst a few in, uh, in the church at Corinth, and, and probably uh, because the Apostle Paul was also involved with the church at Corinth to, to a high degree, he also apparently had received that gift. All right, then, a few decades later, God finished the Bible, and he came to the last book of the Bible, the last chapter, right near the end of the book of Revelation, Revelation 22, verse 18, and there God laid the law down. He says, if anyone adds to the words of the prophecy of this book, I will lay, add to him the plagues written herein. And if anyone uh, takes away from the words of the prophecy of this book, I will take away his share in the tree of life. By that statement, God categorically and emphatically declared that the only divine truth now that we should 
uh, uh, by which we can hear, or the only divine message we would hear, has to come right from the Bible. All right, now that suddenly made a big change. Because until that time, it was possible that someone could still receive a message in a dream, or a vision, or a tongue. That was possible, because God had not finished giving his whole word that he wanted uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to give to the human race. But now he's completed it. And he says, now don't look for uh, a message from God from any other source. Of course, that was a wonderful piece of news because it meant that, uh, that if anybody from that point on said, I received a message from God in a dream or a vision or a tongue, we would instantly know that was of Satan because God will not violate his own rules. And so it was a tremendous comfort to the early church and it is a comfort to all of us that we never, never ha have to wonder have we got the whole word of God or is, uh, is it possible that Satan coming as an angel of light as we read in Second Corinthians 12 that he, or Second Corinthians, yeah, I guess it's 12, uh, that uh, that uh, he uh, uh, will uh, counterfeit the true gospel. And yet, what has happened is, is that in our day, when everybody wants their kind of a gospel, uh, that is why many churches talk about free will. They love that kind of a gospel. Other people were reading uh, 1 Corinthians 14, and they said, Oh! That's what we want. We want some kind of a, uh, an outward evidence that the Holy Spirit is upon us. And so they begin to pray to speak in tongues. Now, God will not accommodate them, of course, because he will not violate his own rules. Aha, but here is Satan coming as an angel of light. What an opportunity, because he can, he can accommodate them. He can speak supernaturally to them in a, some kind of heavenly language and uh, uh, like he is the Lord Jesus he comes as an angel of light and and uh, deceive them and he is the father of lies the Bible teaches so he he really is an expert at deceiving and so they get sucked into a violation of the Word of God a terrible violation remember what it says we're not to add to the words of the prophecy of this book, lest we be subject to the plagues written herein. And the plagues have to do with Judgment Day, the wrath of God. And thank you for calling. And you know, these dear people, they, 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 uh, uh, they say, well, it's in the Bible, isn't it? Yes, it is. And they do what all the false gospels do. They read, they pick and choose what they like, but they don't read the whole Bible. And it's imperative, if we're going to have truth, that we constantly scrutinize what we believe in the light of anything we find in the Bible. And that we are, always have to be ready to say, uh, I was mistaken. I was going down a wrong path because now the Bible has corrected me. In fact, that is the nature of the Bible. Remember, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, that is for teaching, and for correction and for reproof and training in righteousness. And so... If we are a true believer and are broken before God and only want God's word to be found in our life, then we are going to find from time to time we have to be corrected. We, there was something that we thought was the truth, and now we're discovering, no, we hadn't done our homework well enough, and now we have to make correction, and we gladly do that because we want to be more faithful than ever to the word of God. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, hi. How you doing? Very well, thank you. Yeah, I have a, I have a question about on uh, the book of Job. It, it said, um, when the sons of God came to present themselves and Satan was with them, if who are the sons of God? 
The sons of God are the true believers. Now, angels, now, Satan was not a son of God. He is a fallen angel. And uh, angels were not created in the image of God. An angel is not a son of God. Only mankind is. And remember that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When uh, Abel was murdered by his brother Cain, thousands of years earlier than Job, uh, he, in his spirit essence, went to be, to live with Christ in heaven. And, uh, and uh, when uh, Noah died, he went to be with Christ in heaven, and so on. They are the sons of God that are in heaven, and uh, they are in a spirit existence. Their bodies were, are still in the grave somewhere, or returned to the dust. But amongst them came Satan, who is a spirit being. And uh, the amazing thing to me is why throughout the first 11,000 years of the history of the world did God permit Satan uh, entrance into heaven, uh, uh, given the fact that he was the bitter foe of Christ? That's a mystery. I don't, that's God's business, but that we know uh, was the case. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Yes. How are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, I have a question. I, I had a conversation with my wife, uh, and uh, I was trying to uh, elaborate on 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 uh, on the question of uh, if one is not, I mean, if we are all dead, and if uh, if we not saved. And I, I kind of got stuck at the point where I didn't know what to say to the, uh, she's asked me, uh, how would one go and start praying if, if, if we are dead? How do we go and, and start praying? Cause well, now, we, first of all, we are spiritually dead, and let's define that. When man was created perfect, he was given a soul or spirit essence. And in his soul or spirit essence, he was energized by God. It's like a, uh, like a city that is energized by being tied into the electrical grid. Uh, if you cut off that electrical grid, you've got a dead city. It's still a city. It's still a city, but it's, uh, it's, it's an entirely different city. There's no light. There's no electricity. There's no motors that can run. Uh, it is a dead city, electrically speaking, and that would be an illustration of mankind. When mankind rebelled, that God cut off that the electricity or the energizing power of God in his life, and not only that, uh, he was indwelt by God, and I don't understand that, but he that he had that kind of an intimate relationship with God and he no longer is indwelt by God. However, he still had a spiritual or a spirit essence. He still has a soul. A mankind didn't change in that sense. He still has a soul. He's still an entirely different person, a, 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 a creature than an animal who does not, which does not have a soul. He's still able to understand uh, many words uh, of the Bible to some degree. Uh, he can understand concepts. He can understand the concept of sin, this concept of, uh, of penalty for sin, justice, uh, uh, and, and forgiveness. There are many things he can have uh, a fairly uh, reasonable understanding of, even though he's spiritually he is dead. And, and in his spiritual deadness, he understands prayer. He, uh, in fact, we find that the heathen, they uh, cry out to their gods. They make prayers to their gods. They have the wrong god altogether, but nevertheless, they're going through actions that have to do with the fact that they have a spirit essence or a soul. They want to have an identification with God in some way. But when we, when God saves us, then we are are energized again by God, and God indwells us, and we've been given a brand new soul. I, I, 
I'll tell you, that's a concept that is, is way beyond our understanding. And it's such a wonderful concept because in our new soul, we were given eternal life and we, were, and we are guaranteed that we will never, never lose that eternal life. That is, we can never uh, lose our salvation in any way. We can know that all of our sins have been paid for and on and on and on the blessings are there even though we have to live in this world with the thorn in the flesh perhaps and we are going to be reviled and and uh, and we may have to live with uh, with physical difficulties because we live in a sin cursed world but hello I, can i ask another question of course uh uh, uh, okay, so if, if you move for, uh, further in, uh, she's asked me, uh, if, what, what if everything is determined by God? And, and let's say uh, we already know who's, deter- who's, who's, uh, who's selected and who's not. So why would one should pray and, and, or even, even start caring if he knows, okay, I'm not saved, and uh, I'm not going to be saved by God? Why should I even go and, and, and start, uh, start doing something about it if everything is already selected? Well, you, you, that's a temptation, you know, that we take what they call a fatalistic attitude. If it's, if it's going to be, it will be. However, God does not treat us like that. He treats us as those who have been created in the image of God. And, uh, and, uh, uh, therefore, uh, in other words, we're not sticks or robots of some kind, we're just waiting. We, uh, we are treated in, uh, as those who have been created in the image of God, even though we don't understand a whole lot of what, of what God is saying to us about all of this. But nevertheless, uh, 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 God tells us, for example, that, uh, that uh, he gives us the information that he is not a respecter of persons. Oh, well, I can understand that. I'm not saved. I, uh, let's say I'm still not saved. I can understand that. He's not a respecter of persons. That is, uh, whether I'm rich or poor or black or white or brown-skinned or young or old or smart or stupid, uh, if I have a brain of a two-year-old or a brain of a college professor, makes no difference. God is not a respecter of persons. Well, that's a wonderful piece of information. That means I have possibility of also becoming saved. Then I, then I start reading some more in the Bible, and I hear that uh, from the Bible that God has chosen certain ones to salvation. Uh, and I say, oh, well, since he's not a respecter of persons, then he might have chosen me. And, uh, because I know no one can know whether they're chosen unless they actually have become saved. And if they do actually become saved, they'll know that it was only, only because God had chosen them. Well, then they uh, read along. They're still not saved. Uh, and they learn that Jesus came for sinners. Oh, well, I, I know I'm a sinner. Uh, the Bible uh, tells me that, and, and I understand that. Sin, sin is a transgression, a breaking of the law of God, and the Bible is the law of God. And, and my, my, if I get honest with myself, yes, I've sinned again and again and again and again. Ah, oh, but that means I could be one that is chosen because I'm a sinner. Christ came to save sinners. Ah, well, that's everything is, uh, I'm getting some comfort, even though uh, I have no idea whether God will ever save me or not. And then I read some more, and I find that, uh, that uh, it says here, uh, that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Oh, I see. Uh, it, it is as we're in the environment of the Word of God, and the Word of God is the Bible, that is where God does His saving. Oh, well then, I, I want to be in that environment, because I don't know whether God will ever save me, but, but if it is His plan, I want to be there. And so, uh, and, uh, so I'm going to be reading, and as I'm reading and, and, and uh, learning about the Bible, I'm going to be praying 
for understanding, and I'm going to be praying for uh, for obedience, and I'm, I'm I'm learning more and more about who God is, and about my sins, and about uh, salvation, and so on. And then I read that I that God is a merciful God, and I can come and beseech Him. You mean I, who am uh, still a dead sinner, can actually? call upon God yes yes God gives illustration of that in Luke 18 as the as the publican who is who is the lowest of the low in the Jewish mind of that day uh, 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 smote his breast and cried out oh God have mercy on me I'm a sinner and uh, and uh, and it, it had turned out in his case at that point God did save him and so you see uh, even as a dead in the water sinner, we have lots and lots that we can uh, learn from the Bible. I got to pause for this message. We're continuing with the open forum program, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. I'm calling because a couple of weeks ago there was a woman that called you and she asked a question that I'd been thinking about a lot myself. And it was, um, what really is the difference um, for Sunday in regards to our studying and our praying? Um, what more could she do since um, it just seems like that's something that I do all the time. Well, so I started... So you gave a very good explanation, and it's kind of, you know, what I expected you to answer, but it still has been really bothering me, um, because if the, if the Sabbath really is a sign between us and God of his, um, you know, bringing us out of bondage, just like water baptism is a sign, and, um, you know, now in the time that we're in, why don't we just say that it's a sign? Well, it is not a sign. The Sunday Sabbath is not a sign. It's an entirely different day than the Seventh-day Sabbath. Uh, uh, the Seventh-day Sabbath was a sign, like, a, like the Passover day or the, uh, any other feast day of the Old Testament or water or circumcision. They were signs pointing to some spiritual reality. But Sunday is not a sign. It is simply a, a day that God has set up for our spiritual benefit. God has created us. He knows how, how uh, uh, involved we get into the activities of this world. Now, we happen to live in a land of, uh, of great plenty, but more typically throughout the history of the world, uh, people uh, would have to uh, have to... Uh, work their uh, uh, fingers to the uh, uh, to, uh, uh, scratch and, 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 and work hard 12 hours a day just to keep enough food on the table. Uh, we, we don't understand that, but we, because we are so opulent, we are so rich in everything, but all kinds of people in the world have to work very, very hard, long hours, every hour they can find in order to have enough food to eat and have a little shelter over their head of some kind. But God knows that we have to have a specific time set aside uh, to focus all together on spiritual reality. So God carved out one day out of the seven. It's Sunday. That's the Sabbath day. And today, no matter how hungry you are, it is not a day for earning a living. It is not a day for your own thing. This is a day where you are completely free of any responsibility, of any liability, of any uh, uh, whatever uh, uh, to furnish, uh, to provide for your family. It is a day where you are to provide spiritually for your family and, and for uh, countless people. That is an enormous blessing. Now, because we live in such a, a, a uh, easy society and, and, uh, and we have such riches, really we have enormous riches, even the poorest of us, uh, we 
uh, can work for uh, uh, eight hours a day and, and, and have enough food to eat. In fact, not only do we have enough food to eat, but we even have money left over to eventually buy a TV or eventually buy some kind of an automobile or eventually buy uh, something else. That We might even have a little money to buy a cup of coffee uh, during the week and, and so on. And uh, that's riches beyond uh, anything and and so yes we do have time to pray and we do have time to get into the word but that doesn't set aside god's program that there's one day now you you uh, you may think that you are are uh, 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 really focusing on the lord in during the weekday and you do you try to do that but you still uh you're planning your shopping trip you are uh, taking time to weed your garden. You are uh, uh, doing a lot of. You want to wash the windows because you're going to have some friends over, and you want to do not want do not want to have a dirty house. And you got six days to do that. But when Sunday comes, no, 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 no. Remember, don't be smarter than God. Don't be wiser than God. God has set up Sunday to do His will, and He's given illustration. As he said, let there be light on Sunday, as he uh, saved about 3,000 people at Pentecost on Sunday, as he raised Jesus from the dead, uh, who is the first fruits of all of us who become saved on Sunday. In other words, God is really focusing on Sunday as a day for just, just uh, thinking about God's things. We Thank would. Um, I no, Mr. Camping. I have one more question. Yes. Can we can we look at um, Colossians two sixteen? Colossians two sixteen. Let's look at that. Yes, please. And and really, I think I, I don't have my Bible in front of me, but it, it's probably seventeen, where it says that those things are uh, but a shadow of things to come. Yeah. Uh, let's look at that. Colossians chapter two sixteen. Yeah. Um, and 2.17, we read, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath. Now, it's not talking about Sunday Sabbath here. Notice all the, all the uh, uh, things, meat and drink and holy days, new moons, that all had to do with the Old Testament signs. And the, and the Sabbath of the Old Testament was a sign. They were all part of the ceremonial law. And this is clinched when we look at verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come. That is, they were looking forward to uh, the, uh, the uh, spiritual nature of God's salvation plan. Uh, and uh, But the Sunday Sabbath... That is not a shadow. That has nothing to do with being a sign pointing to something. It is simply a day that God has set up for our spiritual welfare so that we would have at least one day out of every seven in which we can thoroughly concentrate on the things of God and not be... Uh, uh, not be uh, confused with the with the necessities and the demands of living in this world. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. How are you this evening, Brother Camping? Very well, thank you. May I say two things? www Family Radio is right. And the second thing I'd like to say is thank you for caring and sharing. Well, thank you for calling and sharing also. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Um, my question is, uh, is it true that before a person can wait on the Lord for salvation, God has to first convict that person uh, of sin or save them? I don't know how God works in anybody's heart. I do know that uh, 
that God saves in his own uh, timetable and God clearly teaches that we have to wait upon the Lord. We never dictate to God and say, look, oh Lord, I, I earnestly desire salvation. Please have mercy and please could it be tonight or could it be tomorrow or next week or whatever. We wait upon the Lord, and we may have to wait until the day before we die or the day before Christ appears on the clouds of glory. But we patiently wait upon the Lord and, and, uh, and ask God for, his, uh, for strength to do that. Now, how God works, I don't know. I don't know, but I do know that when he finally saves us, if, he does, if that's his plan, and if he elected us, he absolutely will save us. Then, then everything happens. We get a brand new resurrected soul. Uh, we uh, have re will re be repenting of our sins. We will be believing, trusting in the Lord Jesus. Uh, we will uh, uh, be calling on his name in the right way and so on. Everything happens because God has made us his child. And that, uh, that... Uh, 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 is what, of course, what we aspire that uh, to have happen in our life. Am, am, am I waiting uh, as I'm? Because I listen to family Bible reading fellowship twice a day. I listen to you every night, um, and and I still I don't know if it's pride or, or what's going on, but I still cannot admit to myself that and to God that that I'm a sinner. No. Am I am I waiting for? As I, as I listen to the Bible reading, am I waiting to just wake up one day and realize that I'm a sinner? And well, you know what I would be doing. I don't know how God is going to work in your life. But now you just made a confession to me, and that's not worth anything. You, you have to confess to God. But anyway, you have just said, I, I, and this was a very, very candid statement and a very important statement. Uh, uh, and that is, I have a hard time admitting I'm a sinner. And, uh, and uh, uh, so what I would be doing, if I were in your shoes, I would be praying, Oh, Lord, I'm having a terrible time admitting I'm a sinner. And yet I, I, uh, I know I need that conviction. I know that in your sight I, I must be a sinner. But, oh, Lord, you've got to convict me. Oh, Lord, that, that I am, uh, I, I have mercy on me and, and uh, open my spiritual eyes so that I really realize that in your sight I'm an ugly, dirty, rotten, miserable sinner. And, uh, and uh, that, that my pride, my self-respect, my self-esteem won't get in the way at all. And, uh, you, you know, that's the wonderful thing about praying. We can, we can tell God just as it is. God knows way more about you than you know yourself, just as he knows way more about me than I know about myself. But, and, and we can't surprise God at all. We, but, but it never is bad, never is bad to level with God. We wouldn't level... You wouldn't say these, some of these things to your wife if you have one or to your close friend or your children if you have children. But when we talk to God, we can, we can lay it right out with all of its misery and all of its stench and stink. Uh, we can lay it all out because God knows anyway. He knows everything about it. And, and uh, we, we can just tell God like it is. Oh, Lord, I'm having a hard time admitting I'm a sinner. Oh, Lord, break me, break me, break me, please break me. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and as I read the Bible, uh, uh, open my eyes. Per please, Lord, have mercy on me. I, I do that, Brother Captain, but, and nothing ever gets better or changes. It's like everything, every day is the same. Just Still keep, just as blind. And, well, but you just keep begging the Lord and begging the Lord and begging the Lord. And I don't know whether the Lord will ever save you. I don't know that. But, but I do know you're never going down a wrong path when you're pleading with God for mercy. 
and in your case you have something very specific you can plead for uh, oh Lord I do recognize I'm a, a, a having a hard time admitting I'm a sinner and I know that uh, that you came for sinners and and oh Lord break me oh Lord sh uh, uh, open my eyes on this question I have another question um, when you say that God's no respecter of persons um, when when he for I don't know if it says anything about this in the Bible but um, uh, when he chose people to become saved um, or elected them um, was there anything about the person or the individual himself um, that he, you know different about them than anyone else or uh, no it, it, when when God looks at the human race God describes what he sees you read it in Romans 3 I'll, t I'll tell you what God sees when he looked down the corridors of time and he saw me and he saw everyone else that he planned to save as well as the rest of the human race uh, what did he see uh, in verse 10 of Romans 3 there is none righteous no not one there is none that understandeth there is none that seeketh after God they are all gone out of the way they are together become unprofitable there is none that doeth good no not one could God be em any more emphatic you see that's what he saw as he looked down the quarters of time he saw a miserable mass of mankind that are in total rebellion against God and everyone is uh, uh, trying to go his own way and then God says in Romans 9 I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy and, and, and in other words God is saying I am absolutely sovereign I can save any one of these miserable rebellious uh, people who have uh, who have uh, betrayed uh, uh, their relationship with me so badly and I don't answer to anybody I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy but it's not because he saw anything in any one of us when he looked at me when he looked at anybody this is what he saw right here in Romans chapter 3 thank you thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good and incidentally that answer that that also uh, helps you to get an answer to your question as you think yeah I really I don't really see sin in my life uh, uh, very much well you just read Romans 3 and ponder on it and ponder on it uh, and and think about it and and read it again and again and again and again and saying and remember this is God's assessment of me this is God's assessment of me and it shows really how blind I am how how proud I am as I am trying to kid myself deceive myself into thinking I'm really a pretty good person and now the question is who's right is my little peanut human mind my wisdom is that where the truth is or is the truth here in the Word of God where God is declaring how he sees me and I think this this might be a, a real good passage that in your particular instance and in any of our lives uh, we can really ponder about good evening brother Kevin how you doing Thank you for calling. Oh, go, Brother go. Kevin, I'm yeah. the new caller. Yeah, go ahead. Um, how you doing tonight? Exodus 22, verse 28. Exodus 22, verse 28. Let's look at that. Exodus 22, verse 28. Thou shalt not revile the gods nor curse the ruler of thy people in the Hebrew does that word gods translate to Elohim I do not know I've never uh, looked at this uh, in the Hebrew my guess is that it does because well I don't uh, uh, my guess is it does but I'm I'm speculating because I've not looked at the Hebrew can we look at another verse please I'd like to look at the book of Job 
chapter 41. Job at 41. Let's look at that. And Leviathan has to be Satan, right? Yes. I believe so. The, I believe so. A lot of people try to say that that's a dinosaur or something. I believe it's Satan because, you know, the Bible talks about God piercing well, Satan well, in the head. Or Well, you know... I uh, uh, actually remember that God uses the word dragon. Uh -huh. Here he used the word leviathan. Now, there were fierce dinosaurs of the past that have become extinct following the flood. Uh, but they, 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 these fierce, some of these animals were quite fierce and, and they did live on this earth. And, and uh, so it's possible that some were living at the time of Job, uh, this, that he knew about these, and God used, uh, therefore, uh, the, the, the Leviathan as a, as a uh, picture of Satan because uh, these animals were quite fierce. Job's wife, do you think she was saved or was she unsaved? Because she uh, made a comment that uh, curse, curse God and die. I have no idea. I have no idea. I, God doesn't give us any more information about his wife. It's funny about all the believers in the Bible, most of their wives were unsaved. You notice that? We don't know that. We, uh, we, God does, it's only occasionally that God gives us enough assurance that we can know someone became saved. We know, for example, that David was saved. We know Solomon was saved. We know Moses was saved and Aaron and Miriam. We have clear information. We know Joshua was saved. We know Hannah. The wife of Elkanah was saved, uh, and so on. There are a, 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 a number of people, but not not very many, that we have clear evidence that they were true believers. But most, almost everybody else who is named or portrayed in the Bible, uh, whether they did good things or bad things, we cannot tell whether they were true believers or not. That God has not revealed that to us. Kevin. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Okay. Uh, let's look at uh, First Corinthians chapter seven. I'm sorry. First Corinthians. Yes. Chapter, chapter seven. seven. First Corinthians chapter seven. Let's turn to that. Yes. And what is your question? Yeah, my question is. How do we compare verse 15 to verse 39? Well, in the, the, the key word in verse 15 is the word bondage. Uh, all kinds of people read 1 Corinthians 15 and they heave a great sigh of relief. Aha! Here is the verse that allows them to be free from their former marriage and they can marry again. Because it says, if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. In other words, it's his, his sin, not my sin. My unbelieving spouse, I, I have to let him go. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. Without realizing it, they are applying the word bondage to their marriage, uh, that is, to their relationship with their wife. But the word bondage is a word that means bondservant or bond slave, And nowhere in the Bible does God speak of the wife being the slave of the husband or the husband the slave of the wife. On the other hand, the Bible does speak in several places about the true believers being a slave of Christ, a bond servant of Christ. And so when it's saying that a brother or sister is not under bondage, it's not. It doesn't mean that the bond, uh, the uh, relation, the the, uh, the the binding uh, relationship between husband and wife has been broken. It means that in your bond servant relationship with Christ, even though this is a terrible thing that is happening, that your marriage is being broken, you have to let it happen because you are called to peace, and it is not in contradiction in any sense with verse 39. The wife that is, let's say it's the wife that wants the divorce, she gets her divorce. But in God's sight, she is still bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. 
Okay, can I ask another question? Yes. All right, you said something about uh, Revelation chapter 22. Yes. Verse uh, 18 and 19. Yes. Uh, are you try what, are, what are you trying to uh, portray? That do dreams are wrong? Is it wrong to have dreams or is it wrong to have visions? I, I'm sorry, repeat that question. Is it wrong to do what? Okay. The revelation you, you shared with us earlier. Yes, about not adding to or taking away from the Word of God. Yeah. Okay. Is it possible to have dreams from God? Is it possible to have prophecies from God? And no, that's not possible because you see, if I if if I would have a dream in which God is speaking to me, that would be the word of God. Now I have two authorities. I have the Bible, that of course I know is the word of God, and I also have what God told me in his dream uh, as as a, an additional word. And God warned, no, that can't happen. You can see what a mess, uh, what a disaster that would be if everyone is listening to what what uh, the Bible says and also listening to what they think God has spoken to them directly. Uh, you know, every true believer is a prophet, and a prophet declares what God has given to him. And my, if every prophet had the possibility of not only uh, declaring what the Bible teaches, but also what God gave to them privately in a dream or a vision or whatever, we would have an enormous disaster because we'd never know where the whole word of God is, because if anybody in the old, in the, while the Bible was still being completed, if someone received a message from God, uh, uh, then then that was uh, that was the word of God that had to be listened to. So if you have a dream, it's not from God; it's out of your own subconscious mind. And if you were not a saved person, it might even be. Uh, supernaturally from Satan, but it, in, uh, in no case would it be from God. What you're saying now is that it is wrong to have dreams? Oh, not a bit. We dream every night. Uh, that uh, In our dreams, uh, yeah, is, I think the way it works out is our subconscious mind is, is straightening out some of the problems that we, we weren't able to straighten out in our minds, and and so in the middle of the night, and sometimes the dream is quite vivid, sometimes we remember it when we wake up, a lot of times we don't remember it, but, and sometimes it all, it relates to just a very, very tiny uh, anecdote, or just even a word that was spoken uh, through the day, or it might even show what we are subconsciously uh, fearing or something, but uh, it, it comes out of our own mind. It has nothing to do with being a message from God. But now we've come to the end of our time, so I have to say good night. Again, I, uh, it's been a blessing to me to have an opportunity to share with you and for you to share with me this word from the Word of God. Until our next open forum, let's continue to read the Bible carefully. And you know, I spoke, of, uh, we got into this Romans 3 thing, and that's a pretty healthy passage for any of us to read and be very, very sensitive to it. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.